Let's all stand if we would as we look at God's promises this morning. Before I have you turn to a verse, I'm going to just have you bow your heads if you would. I want you to do your neighbor a favor and yourself a favor. Look to your left or right and whoever's standing there, would you just bow your head and say a prayer for them because somebody needs that this morning. Wherever you're at, whoever's around you, would you just stop as Miss Dana plays as we just pray one for another. Father, we came here this morning not just to say words, not just to occupy a little bit of time, but Father, we've prayed and studied to declare the very words of the living God. Father, we're here not on accident, but on purpose. Father, there are those in this room that no doubt has had a difficult week. There are those, Lord, that are looking and wondering why their dreams have not come true. Why their prayers have not been answered. Why 2017 was so difficult. Lord, as we come this first Sunday of the new year, we're looking afresh to see what you would have for us. Father, there may be just something that could be said or done today that would point us in the right direction. Lord, we all, from time to time, get off the chosen path that you have desired for us. But Father, if there's not anything else that we can do today, I pray, Lord, that we'll lift your name high and holy. And Father, that we'll stand in awe of you knowing that our life here on earth is so temporal and so short. The book of James tells us it's just a vapor that appeareth just for a little while. And Father, we never know that this could be our last week here on this earth. This might be the last message you may ever hear. This may be the last prayer that you ever get into your heart. And Father, if that's the case, I pray that you take these words and do what man cannot. Father, I pray that you'd push all of the junk that's in our heart and our minds out. And Father, that the Holy Spirit will have free reign. That Lord, that the refreshing Spirit will just come and send a soothing and a soothing and a calmness over us. Father, it's me that I cannot preach this message of myself and God, I'm dependent totally upon you and your words Father I do believe this is what you'd wanted me to speak for today Lord how honestly I've come and want to do your will Father I pray that the folks will not hear me but they'll hear you the folks will not respond to my voice but respond to your voice for those that are lonely and burdened for those Lord that don't even have a clue for those Lord that seem lost and afraid. For that's the very thing that we're going to be looking at today. What an appropriate time to bring these things up on a brand new Sunday, brand new year. Thank you, Lord. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At the start of this brand new year, Maybe you're facing an impossible situation. Perhaps what you're seeking from the Lord is not likely to come to pass in your mind. Is your faith being tested? And each year we are surrounded with impossible situations that seem to paralyze us and cause us to wonder where God is. Maybe you're wanting to know how things can change for this year. We're going to learn that our God does His best work 
in impossible situations. Someone said it this way, impossibilities are the platforms upon which God does his best work. I kind of like that. George Mueller once said, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Did you get that? Faith begins when man's power ends. Sometimes you just need to know that your impossibilities are possible when God gets involved. Come on, 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 come on. One more time. You just need to know that your impossibilities are possible when God gets involved. Amen. Each of us here today desire a life that runs smoothly. A life where you never experience a loss. A life that is real in person as it appears on Facebook. Now, at the beginning of this new year, we will notice some important truths that will help you perform at, at your very best. Remember, if you want a life of fewer distractions and less drama, this is for you. Let me show you something from the outset. This is not where we're going to go, but I want to show you Revelation chapter 22, and I want to show you a verse before we get into our main course of study this morning. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, if you will. Notice what the Bible says. Blessed are they, now watch this, in the last book of our Bible, in the last chapter of the Bible, the Bible says this, blessed are they which do His commandments. You need to underscore that. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But the focus of the verse is this. This verse teaches us that we are blessed if we do what the Lord commands us to do. Blessed are they that do His commandments or happy are they who do His commandments. I'll submit to you today, you that are miserable, you that are unhappy, and you that look like you've just lost your last friend when you walked in the building this morning, you're that way because you're not doing what God wants you to do. Amen, preacher. Now, the, the word blessed here means supremely blessed or well off. Think about this. Here's what the scripture says. You are well off if you do His commandments. You never thought about it that way. You're well off. You're better than average. This should be on your New Year's resolution list. We know that offenses, difficulties, hurts, pain, stress could come our way this year. And somehow, before you get into those situations, you need to know that you can get through even when the odds don't look in your favor. How do I know this? It's because we've experienced it last year. Even when the odds didn't look in your favor, somehow God pulled you through. Even when you came to the preacher and emailed me and texted me and said some things to me and says, there's no way you're sitting here today because God made a way for you. What is your method of getting through your heartaches? What if there was a way in which you could achieve greater success this year than last year? What if you could learn something that could prepare your heart in an event of a setback, a sadness, or a sorrow? Today, I'd like to share with you a story to dig deep in the weeds and find some truths that will help someone here today. And along the way, we will show you our New Year's verse. Whoop! Everybody look. You've asked, Preacher, what's our New Year's verse? I'm going to tell you. Matter of fact, I had difficulty with this because it just felt like maybe the uh, last year the verse came so easy. And this year we sought and we prayed and we begged. And finally for the last four or five weeks, God impressed this verse upon my heart. And before we end today, I'm going to give a huge challenge to you and a huge challenge to me. But if you're ready for the challenge, we're going to ask you to do something we normally don't do. We're going to ask you to stand for the second time. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 3. This is not our text, our main verse for the year. I'll get there. But this is where we're going to launch out from today before we get there. Exodus chapter 14 and verse number 3. For Pharaoh will say unto the children of Israel that they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he shall flow, follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon his host. And the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. You need to circle that. And they did so. 
And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they says, why have we done this? And what if, uh, that we have let Israel go from serving us. That he had made ready his chariot. Now watch this. And took his people with him and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. I'll explain that in just a minute. But the Egyptians pursued after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and all the horsemen and his army overtook them, and camped them by the sea. Besides those two hard words there. All right, I'll let you pronounce those. You know that the Lord finally delivered Israel out of Egyptian bondage and the Passover was now complete. The blood was applied and now Israel would be spared and saved. That'd be another message to preach. Now these freed Jews was going eastward into the wilderness, which was the direction of Canaan. Now I want you to understand something. Before you sit down, before you get comfortable, I want you to get this. I want you to see this and I want you to get this. These free Jews was now free from this Egyptian bondage. They were going eastward into the wilderness, which was the direction of Canaan, which was where God said they would go. But then God ordered them to turn and go in a different direction down the west side of the Red Sea. Now here's where, here's where all of us stand today. Here's where you stand and here's where I stand. And I don't understand this. I can only, I can only try to fathom this in my mind. But after all of these years in bondage and the torment that these Jews were going and all of the miraculous things God did, now He says, I'm going to bring all of you out. We're going to Canaan. Everybody's happy and we're all marching to Canaan. And all of a sudden, out of no reason, out of no rhyme, out of no, uh, no one can explain it. God says, no, I don't want you to go that way. Wait, 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 wait. I know that's not important to you, but let me give you the reason that's a big deal. Sometimes God tells us to go away that don't make, make sense to us. Have you ever noticed in 2017, we were going in this one way, and all of a sudden, for some reason that you don't understand, your direction was changed. Maybe a job changed. Maybe a family member changed. Maybe your circumstances changed. But you thought you were doing okay and you changed and you are going so well. And even those that were serving God, you are going with all gusto and with all strength. And you are marching and marching and marching. And somewhere right in the middle of that, God says, I don't want you to go that way anymore. I know you're still standing. Hang on. Somebody in here this morning, you marched in here. And your direction could change today. Your direction could change today. But here's what you said. Preacher, I marched in this way and I'm going to march out that way. Well, it might not happen that way. Because if you'll hang on with me. I'm going to show you some things that maybe you've never seen before, never thought of before. All right, you can sit down. Some of you give me dirty looks. All right, sit down. That was part of God's plan. As a pastor, here's what I've noticed. Sometimes the will of God makes little sense to us. You know, sometimes I've seen your life, and, and I've seen your life, I've seen your life, and sometimes by me watching you and by my own encounters myself, I've prayed to God in 2017 and I've prayed this prayer honestly. God, that just does not make sense. God, I just don't understand that. And why on earth would you allow something like this to come into old people's lives? Lord, why in the world would you allow something like this to come into my life? I strictly do not understand this. You are indeed rare if you have not found yourself in a God-directed circumstance that made no sense to you. At the time, you thought that was the last thing that you needed. And this was a huge turning point for this whole story. And I'll get there. You see, the people were beginning to question Moses' leadership. Now, 
I want you to understand, everybody focus, everybody focus is first Sunday of the year, so let's focus right the first Sunday of the year. Amen. Come on, come on. Now here, watch, watch this. Moses, the emancipator, made all of these dramatic things happen, the water, blood, and lice, and boils, and all of the frogs. You know the story, right? All of this happened. Now watch this. And God says, I'm going to deliver you. Watch I'm going to deliver you into Canaan. So everybody was happy. And the Jews got freed. And before, watch, before the Jews left Egypt, you know what they did? They spoiled the Egyptians. Did you ever know this? Only God could do this. These people have been tormentors to the Jews. So before the Jews left and all of these million people left, they spoiled the Egyptians, got all of their stuff, and now they're on their way to Canaan. And God says something like this, By the way, since you're on your way to Canaan and that's where you're going to go, I'm going to take you a different direction. And here's, here's where you come in. But God, I want to go the easy way. But see, God, if, if, if you don't lead me this way, and I've got to go around the hard way, what on earth can I learn from that? Don't you know God's in heaven saying, I'm glad you asked me that. I'm glad you asked me that, because I'm going to show you something, and it's going to, it's going to help our church in the new year. Stay with me. Now listen to this. So all of these people now, Moses has led them out. Moses all of a sudden told them something like this. We're going to go a different way. Now, knowing human people like I do, here's what they say. Has he lost his mind? What in the world's up with Moses today? Did he eat something bad? And I can tell you, listen to me. If you directed two to three million people, you think about the gripes this guy had. Think about, watch, think about it. He says this, we're going this way. And all of a sudden, God says, no, you're not. We're going to switch courses. And Moses had to tell his people, by the way, we're going the different way. Here's what his people thought. Oh, boy. We got stuck with a guy that don't even know where we're going. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. We had it bad in Egypt. Now he's taken us out of Egypt into the wilderness. And now we don't know where we're going. What a crazy guy this is. Why did we let Moses do this? Why are we following Moses? This was a critical point in Moses' leadership. Now, whether, now watch this. Whether he would succumb to the people or whether he would just stand his ground and say something like this, I'm going to trust God to do the best thing for you. Now, in the midst of a problem, in the midst of all of the griping, in the midst of all of the complaining, it wouldn't it have been easy for Moses to say something like this, God, I don't think you know the best for me. And so because of this, I think I'm going to go the original way that I was supposed to go. I am not going to turn. It would have been easy for him to do that. Come on, come on, come on. It would have been easy for that. And the reason why some of you are in your mess today is because God wanted you to go a different direction. But in your mind, you says, I am not changing course. I'm going to go what I want to do. And because of that, you've lived a, you've lived a miserable life. You're not fun to be around. You're cranky. You're irritable. And that is on your good day. <laughs> Exodus 14, 3. For Pharaoh was saying to the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land and the wilderness has shut them in. So Pharaoh figured the Israelites were trapped. So he thought that he could go catch them and force them back to Egypt. In chasing the Israelites, it would, listen to this, it would be that he knew they were trapped and Pharaoh says this, I've got them right where I want them. Skip down to, uh, I'm, I'm going quickly, uh, Exodus 14, 7. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. Pharaoh ordered the best of his army to go after the Jews. But notice something interesting at the verse number 8. I've never caught this before, never paid attention to this. Look at verse number 8. You need to see this. I want you to mark this in your Bible because I think this is neat. At the end of verse number 8, it says, He went out, they went out with a high hand. This means that the Jews were going out with confidence. They were going out with courage. 
This was a time of great victory for the Jewish people. So here's what they're saying. On the outset, as God told them to go out, they were, they were confident in what God was going to do for them. In other words, they were telling the Egyptians, we ain't afraid of you, we ain't afraid of you, so rah, 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 rah. We've got, we got this whole situation figured out. So they were marching, they were marching, they went out with the high hand, they went out with confidence. What happens? Come on. What happens from the time of... Your confidence in God. And why do we do this? Watch. Why do we do this? Why do we start at the first of the year with confidence in God? And by the time of the new year, we just kind of do it like this. At the, at the first of this new year, we have high hand. That don't sound very good, but we have confidence. We have belief that God's going to do something wonderful. But each success is Sunday. We, we start here. But next Sunday, some of you are going to be just about, about here. And by December of next year, you're going to be way down here. And the preacher is going to be pumping you up again and say, We can do it, we can do it, we can do it. That's where the Jews were. They, they, listen, they were right. They were confident. Man, this thing that God's going to deliver us out, we have got this. Man, we're going to get our new home. We're going to get all of this new stuff. And God's going to bless us continually. And man, we have got it made. But look at verse number 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them, and all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen, his army, overtook them in camping by the sea. Uh-oh. Pharaoh found the Israelites in a condition that was very vulnerable to attack. These Jews were in their tents by the sea, and it appeared an easy victory for Pharaoh and his army. Skip down to verse 10 very quickly. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, here we go. Here's where the situation changes. The children of Israel did what? They lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. Now watch. And they were so afraid. Now wait a minute. Back up here just a little bit. They went out with a high hand. They went out with confidence. They went out with courage. How do you go, how do you go out with courage? Now the Bible says they were afraid. <laughs> you can see an important life principle here. When life attacks you and has you surrounded, your fear prompts you to doubt God. Amen, preacher. That's pretty good. Thanks. Look at verse number 11. And they said unto Moses, Uh-oh, because there were no graves in Egypt, thou hast taken us away to die in the wilderness. Therefore thou hast dealt us with us to carry us out of, forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians that we should die in the wilderness. Here we see they were blaming Moses. Every leader knows this. Complaint. When circumstances go wrong, the leadership is going to take the brunt of it. So it was Moses' fault. God led him to the exact spot. Secondly, they were complained that where they were. They told Moses something like this. Didn't we tell you that we would be better off staying in Egypt under these hard Egyptians, even though we're tormented and whipped and scourged and not fed properly every day? Didn't we tell you just to leave us alone? Listen to this. We see God's people in impossible situations. The Red Sea on one side, the wilderness on the other, Pharaoh's army coming up from behind them. And this is the defining moment and things were not looking good. And I want to tell you this. Here's something that I have figured out. Everybody watch, everybody watch. I'm, I'm, I'm hurrying. Everybody watch, watch, watch. When things get bad in a situation, an office, a church, I don't care what it is, but you, listen, sometimes you got to dig your spurs in and you just got to trust what God is going to do. Amen. You have no other thing to lean on. You can't lean on your resources. You can't lean on your money. You can't lean on your power. You can't lean on who you are and your reputation. No. When things get bad and things are coming at you and you're surrounded, the wilderness on one side, the Red Sea in front of you, Pharaoh's coming up with all these chariots, and these people are seeing the smoke, and these people are seeing the army, and they know this. We are going to die. And naturally, they turn to Moses and say something like this. It's your fault. Nobody ever considers what I'm fixing to say. But isn't it possible? Isn't it possible that God may deliver you from this bad situation and put you over here because he's got something better? I, I know, watch. 
Even though you're looking at your circumstances and you're seeing all of this stuff come at you, your lost job, your lost income, and you, you, you lost this, and, and you've had a bad, bad year, and you gripe and you complain, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's their fault, it's never my fault. It's good. But God may be saying this, hang on, hang on, hang on. I got this, I got this. Here's what I'm fixing to do. I'm fixing to take you from a bad spot. I'm going to put you in a good spot, but you're just going to have to trust me. Ah, 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 ah. I'm going to remember this in two, three weeks, what you just told me. I'm just going to remember what you said. Some of you said, amen. Uh-huh. And when you get in a tough spot, I'm going, to, I'm going to remind you. Remember what I told you? Remember what I told you? Sometimes God takes you from a rough spot, puts you in a spot that all you can do is depend on him. Sometimes that's where he wants you to be. Because here's what he knows. The more you depend on Him, the more you're going to love Him. The more you're going to depend on Him, the more you're going to serve Him. And the more that He puts you in this difficult spot, the more He knows that you know that all you can do is trust Him for each step along the way. You can't go back. You can't go this way. You're surrounded. And you're just going to have to say this, Lord, I don't understand it, but I'm going to trust you. And Moses' leadership was at a crisis point. His, his leadership could have crumbled at this point. But he did some things that were absolutely phenomenal in our Bible and phenomenal for you and my life as well. Now listen to this. I want to show you something, and I don't ever want you to forget this. If you have your Bibles, I want you to mark something because there's a word that I want to define for you. In, in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse number 11, I want to show you this. And I want to make sure that you get this. This week, well, I'll, I'll just tell you this. This week I needed this verse in my own life for a particular reason. And I'll share with this later to you. But all right, I want you to get this. Is everybody following me so far? Okay, I want you to see this. Watch. For I, come on, know the Thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. All right. Now, I want you to see something. This verse has taken a new significance. A lot of times, you'll see this verse in a lot of Christian bookstores. As a matter of fact, it's on folders, it's on books, it's on coffee mugs, and you'll see this everywhere you go in a Christian bookstore. Okay, now watch this. That word thoughts, circle that word thoughts in your Bible. And I want you to put a little dot or a little arrow up above that word thoughts. And that word thoughts simply means plans. Listen to it. For I know the plans that I think toward you. Wait. Saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a, an end, to give you what I want you to give you. Jesus is saying this. Christ is saying this. I know, listen, I know the plans that I have for you. Listen. I can take you out of a difficult situation over here and put you in a situation here that don't make no sense to you, but you're going to have to know this. I know the thoughts. I know the plans that I have for you. And if you'll just trust me, my plan is greater than your plan. Are you getting this? We're leading to somewhere, so hang with me. It's building, it's building, it's building. So here's what's happening. God says, I've got a plan for your life. You may not understand it, but you've got to trust my abilities to get you through. Now, I know maybe sometimes your last year wasn't so great, and this last year was probably difficult for many, but I'm telling you this. God knows the steps that you need to take. He numbers our days. He knows the hair on our head. And, beloved, He knows exactly the best plan and the course of action for you. Now, I want to tell you this. Everybody look at me. I don't know how many people are in the world. I, I get estimates all the time. Let's just, for the sake of it, let's just say 7 billion people in the world. God has a plan for each one of us. Wow. Israel thought Moses couldn't get it done. There was no way, no way out. It was impossible. Now listen to this. Sometimes we're tempted to believe that you are, listen, you are where you are in life. Because someone led you wrong. 
Because someone did you wrong. Someone said something to you and you have never forgiven them. As a matter of fact, it's easy for me and it's easy for you sitting here today to blame everybody else for the situation that you're in right now. Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait. This is the generation in which we live. Our younger generation has got this down to a pat. It's everybody else's fault. It's my mom's fault. It's my dad's fault. It's all of these. Uh, sometimes I ought to call mother and pop and spank them instead of for all they've done for me. So we sit, we sit down there and we gripe and groan. We don't have what we want. We don't have what we think we need. And we, we, we accuse everybody. And this is exactly where the Jews were. Man, this is not what we bargained for, Moses. This is not we, what we signed up for. Moses, don't you understand? We told you we would let you lead us if you took us straight to the promised land. <laughs> but God says, i got another way I want you to go first. If you'll trust me, my other way, my hard way, will be better than your easy way. Now see, wait a minute, I can't get that. I can't get that. Here's all I see. I want the easy way. I don't want any dis, uh, uh, missteps. I just want things to be easy in my life. Well, that's just not how things work. Are you one of those type of persons that just has to do everything the hard way? Wait a minute. Are you one of those type of people that have to learn it the hard way? Judy and I have this joke. If we see anything that says easy instructions on it, we laugh. Because there's no such thing as easy instructions for us. Have you ever put something together and about the time you think it ought to be put together, there's a part missing or a screw that you've lost on the carpet and you can't find it? This stuff like that happens all the time. It's just not easy. And there's the Jews. They got their eyes this way. Watch. This is, this is so fascinating. They got their eyes this way. God says, nope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you go this way. God, I'm tired. I know you're tired. Lord, you're taking us around the wrong way. Yeah, I know that. But here's where I want you to go. But Lord, I don't want to go. Th I know that you don't want to go that way. But here's, here's what I'm telling you. Even though they did not want to go that way, they still ended up in the spot God wanted them to be. Is anybody getting this? So all of this has life applications to us this morning. Something that I want you to see. Are you still awake? I want you to notice verse 13. Please, let, 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 let's look at this. Wow, what a man. What a guy. And Moses said unto the people, circle these, he says several things in this that's interesting for us. Fear ye not, number one. Number two, stand still. And number three, see the salvation of the Lord. You see, now, wait a minute. Moses was being criticized. Moses had people climbing on him from all angles. And he knew that he was in a critical juncture of his leadership. It could have gone either way. But Moses decided to stand where God stands. And he told the people this, fear ye not. And stand still. Now, you want the modern application for that word stand still means? Shut up! That's what it means. Quiet! We're going to do what God wants you to do. Why? Because we're going to see the salvation of the Lord. If you guys will calm down a minute. If you guys would just, just, just trust God, just calm down. Fear not. God's going to do something wonderful. By the way... I'm going to use that here in just a minute. Which he will show to you what? Today. Mm. Wow. This is where we can become unhinged. We don't like to wait. And we don't believe sometimes that God's working on our behalf. I guarantee you. Patience is one of my virtues. I can't stand it, don't like it, you don't like it, and I don't like it. Let's get her done yesterday is my motto. But there's some reasons why God lets us wait sometimes. Look at number one. Look at number one. Waiting reveals our true mo mo motives. 
People who don't have good motives will not wait long because they're not interested in the commitment it takes to see something through. They want short-term gains for their solution. Even though the short-term gains may not be the best for them, they're settling for the worst. Number two, waiting builds our... Oh boy, I really don't even want to write that, but patience, waiting builds our patience in our lives. If we can't wait for the Lord to do small things... We certainly can't wait for God to do something bigger. Number three, waiting builds anticipation. We tend to cherish and take care of things we have to wait for. Number four, waiting builds our character. Waiting has a way of rubbing the rough edges off of our lives. And number five, waiting builds our dependency on God. We may not always understand why we have to wait, but the good news is that God never asked us to wait without Him. Amen, preacher. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 15, it says this, And the Lord said unto Moses, This is a controversial verse, so I want to show you this. And I, I, don't, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I want to show you this. Everybody, everybody get this. Watch. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. Now, obviously, we're not getting a full story and we're not getting the full detail of what happened here. Something happened between the Lord and Moses that we're not getting here. We're just getting a snapshot. But finally, the Lord was kind of irritated with Moses, and he says something like this. Moses, quit crying unto me. It's time for you to get up. Watch this. It's time for you to get up and speak to the children of Israel and get going in the direction I've told you to go. Now see, we, we don't get what the conversation between God and Moses was, but here God was just kind of frustrated with Moses that he was standing too long in his place, and he was, he was telling him, look, you tell the people, now watch this, you tell the people it's time to get going in the way I'm going to tell you to go. So Moses obviously was having a pity party. Oh, obviously Moses here kind of had a pout party. Now I know none of you ever do that. I, I understand that. None of you ever get on a pity party. That, that's fine. But this guy was. And finally, God had had enough and says, it's time, listen, Calvary Baptist Church, it's time for every family that they go forward. Some of you have been in last year too much. Some of you have not even rubbed 2017 off of you yet. May I suggest it's time for you to rub that off and let's go forward. Can we believe God when He says to go forward? Or are we ready with a pocket of excuses and to tell Him why we can't? I want to show you this and then we'll hurry up. Then we'll get to our verse. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21. Watch this. I want to show you this. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. And made the sea dry, and the waters were divided. You remember when they says they can't go forward? What did God do? He made a way forward. Look at verse 22. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. Wow. And the waters were walling them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea. Even all, underscore that word all, of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and horsemen. God made a way. But here's what the people were saying. Yes, Moses, God made a way, but they're still following us. It's still difficult. You're still not fulfilling your promise. The impossible happened. The Red Sea opened up, and the Jews walked on dry, dry ground, but they were still saying, What's up, God? Are you following this? Look at verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its strength, and the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all, here's that word all again, the host of Pharaoh, and they came into the sea after them. There remained not so much one of them. The nation of Israel went from impossible to impossible. Why? Because the Lord got involved. Not only did the Lord make a way, He even defeated all their enemies in the process. Now look, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Remember what, I, what, what, what ago when I told you this? They were here. They wanted to go here. But God took them this way. Remember this? If they would have just went here, their enemies would have kept on and on 
and on and on. Because God took them the way they did not want, God defeated all their enemies. You see, what turned out to be something that they couldn't understand, God had it all in his hand. God says, I'm going to defeat all the bad guys for you. And if you'd have went that straight course like was originally designed, you'd have been followed and hounded and hounded and hounded and hounded. But if you trust me, I'm still going to get you to that spot, but I'm going to defeat your enemies in the process. So what? Okay, here it is. So what? Maybe there's something that uh, you don't understand. On the surface, nothing that we talked about this morning made any sense to the people. Nothing looked, imposs- nothing, nothing looked possible for those people. When they set out during their, their, their track to get to the Canaan, they never figured that where they'd have to end up. It looked impossible. Everything was against them, which leads me to this. After much thought and consideration for us as a church going forward in 2018, I believe I found a verse that we're going to stake and that we're going to hang our hat on and that we're going to believe for all of 2018. Are you ready? I'm not taking this out of context because I know the context is what it's in. I've studied it. I've read it. You've read it. All God's people understand this. But for the sake of just taking this verse And applying it to not only what we just heard, but applying it to your situation. And I'm going to ask you a question here in just a minute. Here is our verse for 2018. Luke chapter 1. Go ahead, Brother Chris. Luke chapter 1, verse 37. For with God... Come on, come on, church. One more time. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're facing at work, at home, with, with, with what you're going through your mind right now. But I'm telling you, Miss Janice, is anything impossible with God? Missy, is anything impossible with God? Brother Paul, Brother Jim, is anything impossible? Brother Robert Allen East, anything impossible? Miss Cleta, anything impossible with God? Brother Eddie, anything impossible? Anything impossible with God, Brother Boone? Anything? Miss Zane, anything impossible? Listen, we know this. We know this. We know this. But sometimes in our strength, in our, in our, in our, in our inability to get things processed in our minds, we gripe and we groan and we, we say and we get down in the dumps. Listen, I'm telling you, nothing shall be impossible with God. I don't know what you're going through, but I'm telling you, we serve a God of great potential. We serve a God that can come down at any moment and do whatever He wants in my life and in your life. Listen to me one more time. Mac, is anything impossible with God? Miss Gail, anything impossible with God? Warren, is there anything impossible? With... Do you understand what I'm talking about? There's nothing impossible with God. Here's what you're saying. Yeah, but you don't know my son. No, 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 no. I'm talking about there's nothing impossible with God. Your marriage, your finances, your job, your preacher, your dog, your cat. I don't know what it is, but nothing is impossible with God. I'm going to tell you something. In 2018... We're going to get through some impossible situations because God is possible. We're going to get through some things that you're sitting here right now. So, well, I don't know what those are. And just depending on what they are, that's what I'm going to... No, 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 no. Even before we get to those situations, we're just going to believe that God is possible. We're just going to believe that God is able. We're just going to believe that God can do something with my life and your life that we've yet seen before. We're going to believe, Brother Kyle, that God's going to do something with Calvary Baptist Church that we've never, ever, 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 ever seen before. We're going to believe the impossible. We're going to dream big. We're going to pray big. We're going to, we're going to just have our faith big as, as, as mountains. And we're just going to see what God is going to do when we just quit believing the impossibles and we start believing 
of possibilities. One more time. Is anything impossible with God? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Anything. All right? Brother Boone, come on. Miss Dana, come on. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I know what you said. And it's easy to say that in the confines of a church. I know that. And it's easy, easy for me to preach that in the confines of a church. But when that devil throws that fiery dart at me in the morning, am I still going to believe that God can do the possible and the impossible with my life? Here's where you come into play. Here's where you come in to play. If you honestly, 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 honestly believe God can do the impossible with you and with our church, we're going to ask you who will take a step forward with the preacher this morning and to believe that. Who will take a step forward this morning and say, I'm going to hold your hand up, preacher, and I'm going to believe that God can do the impossible. If you believe that, you come on. All over the front. All over the front. If you believe that God can do the impossible with you and your situation in which you're going through right now, you come on. Whatever it may be, health, sickness, disease, financial difficulties, if you believe that God can do the impossible, would you come on? If you believe God can do what only God can do, would you come on? This is not for the preacher. This is your belief that God can do the impossible in 2018. We're tired of praying small prayers. We're tired of trusting a small God. We're tired of not believing that God can do something impossible. We're going to believe and trust big. We're going to pray big. We're going to do big things for God in 2018. If you believe that, lift your hands up in the air this morning. If you believe that, come on, all over the building. If you believe that, lift your hands up. Father, you see these hands. It's not because of me. It's because we have decided that we're going to start praying big, believing big, and our faith will quit being small. We're going to believe God for the impossible. We're going to believe for those that are sick and afflicted that you can heal their diseased bodies. Father, for these that have never known Christ, we're going to believe that you can save them before it's eternally too late. Father, we're going to believe those that have been out and indifferent towards the calls of Christ that they'll come back and be with us and come alongside us. Father, we're going to believe, God, that you can do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. You can even start the process this morning. Father, if there is somebody in this room that doesn't know Christ as Savior, and you say, Preacher, I just don't know Him. And I'd like to know Him and get my new year started right. You come and tell the preacher after service. And we'll certainly deal with that. We believe God for the impossible. We believe, Lord, that all things are possible. We're tired of, we're tired of going through mundane lives. We're tired of just having no passion towards you. An author said this last week, we are saved enough just to be bored of God, but we're not saved enough to be excited with God. Father, I, I don't want to be bored with God. I want to be excited with God. You may put your hands down if you will. And before we go back to our places, I want to give you an opportunity to pray for this church. Pray for your preacher. Pray for one another. And we can see God do something impossible this year.